First of all, I just want to say I'm so excited. Happy Tuesday. Um, thanks to everyone joining us um, in California and beyond and across the country. My name is Ryan Smith. I serve as the Chief External Officer for the Partnership for Los Angeles Schools. Uh, and I'm so excited about uh, the, uh, the, the reaction we've gotten from this event already. We have 600 folks who have RSVP'd um, from LA and throughout California and across the country. So um, welcome uh, to our webinar. Uh, just a little bit uh, to uh, set the table for this discussion. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Partnership for LA Schools, um, we launched in 2007 as a collaboration between Los Angeles Unified, um, founding uh, partners Richard Mally Lundquist, the City of Los Angeles, and a coalition of uh, public uh, partners from um, across the city. Uh, we're not a charter organization. We partner with LA Unified as an in-district uh, uh, support organization, and we're one of the largest uh, in-district reform efforts uh, in the entire country. Uh, we currently manage and support 19 LA Unified schools, close to 15,000 students, and some of my favorite communities uh, in uh, Los Angeles and Watts, Boyle Heights, and South LA. And we do a lot of advocacy work in LA and beyond to close stubborn equity gaps um, that we see um, exist. Please learn more about the partnership at www.partnershipla.org or you can visit our partnership playbook to learn more about our approach, uh, which we have included in the chat discussion. So why are we convening this webinar now? Well, in day 1012 of the quarantine, um, we are still experiencing unprecedented times. We know that states are now reporting declines in tax revenues as much as 25% or a third of their revenues compared to the previous uh, for previous year, uh, according to the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities. Uh, during the Great Recession, which many people are comparing this time to, the US lost roughly 120,000 teachers between 2008 and 2010. And as we barrel towards a vaccine or treatment, um, one can anticipate the upcoming summer learning loss and massive gaps in literacy development that will occur in the face of school closures um, for the unforeseeable future. However, we've seen um, district officials, labor leaders, educators, and community members come together to really meet the needs, both the, uh, the, the uh, basic needs of our students and families, um, as well as the academic needs. Um, we are so excited to uh, see that there's an urgency, particularly to support the highest needs schools in LA and across the country. Uh, and we think this may be a moment to think about how we continue some of the efforts to close achievement and equity gaps, um, how we continue the momentum that we're starting to see now moving forward. So as we talk about what's next, um, for the for the country, we have brought back we've brought a dynamic group of education uh, leaders, um, experts, um, community organizers, labor leaders, uh, board members, uh, people who have expertise in families and communities to discuss what are the big ideas moving forward. So who's with us on the call? We have nearly 600 people registered, and we'll update that um, as we continue across uh, uh, during the day. And if you haven't already, say hello, share your name and um, in the chat box and we'll move forward from there. So you should have all received uh, a, an email just before the webinar with a link uh, with the speaker's bios and a link to the webinar exit ticket, which we'll ask you to complete at the webinar's conclusion. So please, uh, uh, please look at that in your inbox. And everyone has been muted to make sure we can hear our speakers. As you can imagine, 600 people is a lot of folks, um, but we'll continue to engage. Our chat box is live. Um, we like to have a quote unquote lit chat box. So we do ask you uh, to make sure to put your comments and questions in there as well. And we have two of um, our staff members monitoring to answer your questions as they can. And at the end of the webinar, uh, we will pull um, questions from the chat room in order to move forward. Uh, last thing I'll say is that this webinar um, is being recorded and will be available through Facebook Live as well. 
Um, one of my colleagues will put our Facebook address um, in the chat box. Uh, so you'll be able to receive that post the webinar as well. And as you ask questions, please include your name and uh, your organization um, and where you're joining us from so that we can reference that um, as we ask questions. So we wanna make this as engaging as possible. So we have an opening poll, which I'm excited to launch. Um, we wanna help frame the conversation. So we're gonna launch the poll right now with the question, do you believe that there's discrete ways in which our public education system can emerge from this pandemic stronger than before COVID? If so, in which areas do you see this opportunity for this? And you'll see um, a number of categories, family and community engagement, school day and instruction, coordination of whole child services and supports, resource equity, technology, other, and I don't believe we'll emerge stronger in any of these areas. So if you can take the next um, 30 seconds and answer that, and then we'll share the results. Yes, you only get, I just saw a question, only one option. Um, there, are, there are multiple options. And once again, if we haven't captured yours, completely understand we may be able to capture an area of interest of yours in um, the question and answers. Right now we have 72%, 73% of the folks have voted. So we'll take another 20 seconds. All right, and we are going to share the results. So as you see, 21% uh, have, 21% uh, have chosen family and community engagement, which is a passion of mine. And I think it's gonna be an important topic for the panel. Um, you see that 13% uh, have, have chosen school day and instruction, 17% uh, coordination of whole child services and supports and the list goes on as well. So we'll reference this poll uh, as we move forward and we thank you for participating. Uh, without further ado, I wanna give it to our amazing moderator. Um, I like to call this group the uh, Justice League of Equity Champions, people who have been doing the work for a long time and um, our very own moderator and CEO of the Partnership for Los Angeles Schools, Joan Sullivan, um, is absolutely one of those Justice League equity champions uh, who has served as an educator her entire life and has served as a CEO for the partnership for the past seven years um, and is a mother of children in LAUSD. So without further ado, I give it to my colleague, Joan. Joan. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I, I have the privilege of moderating this fantastic panel. Um, you know, as soon as I was old enough to really understand the stories of heroes like Harriet Tubman, I was I was interested in finding our generation's super lever for social change. Um, and I was still in high school when I realized that my personal bet would be on our system of public education. So for 20 plus years, I've been working toward a world where educational our educational system fulfills its potential. We often talk about students filling, it's fulfilling their potential, but it's the education system um, that I think of when I think of fulfilling its potential as a vital lever for social justice and social change, for equal access and shared power, for turning the patriarchy and systemic racism on their nasty heads. Um, and it's been a long road. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a tough business we're in. But when COVID hit, I started to wonder when I wasn't wrestling off my own children, uh, now omnipresent, are there opportunities here and now um, for us as it, as it relates to the system fulfilling its potential that we can collectively unearth? And this is when I was introduced to the idea of punctuated equilibrium. So it's the theory in evolutionary biology that once a species appears in the fossil record, um, 
the population becomes mostly stable. So once it starts to exist and is in the fossil record, it goes on pretty much unchanged. In other words, they show species show little evolutionary change for most of their geological history. And this state of little or no change is called stasis, a concept that uh, is familiar to those of us who work in these big systems. Anyway, when significant evolutionary change occurs, the thought is that it's generally restricted to um, rare and geologically rapid events. So punctuated equilibrium sits in contrast to the idea that evolution has occurred uniformly. No, things are mostly static and that's been dominant over the course of, of the history of species. But then there are these COVID-like events that cause rapid evolution. And here we are. So I sort of asked myself, is COVID our rare and geologically rapid event that will interrupt the stasis that we know and in many ways probably perpetuate, but certainly aspire to interrupt? So does this represent an opportunity to bring about dramatic change, maybe, maybe not in the human species, but in the systems we've built? And I think yes. So we see the potential for this in the lessons COVID is teaching us about climate change for sure. Um, and as a student of education for my whole adult life, as an LA Unified Parent, as the CEO of this nonprofit that lives in the system so that we can help find opportunities for scalable change, there are a few things that come to mind for me as I apply this concept of punctuated equilibrium to the moment. And when I look ahead to the future of education in Los Angeles and beyond, I think about the topics we're going to talk about today. Like, how do we change the vision for the school day and instruction? Um, how do we partner with parents and caregivers in all together more meaningful ways, knowing that student that we need to center everything on the student experience? How do we amplify equity uh, with all these fundamental, persistent, and, and pernicious racial and socioeconomic disparities laid bare? Um, how do we build the will to adequately fund our schools and let equity guide our resource decisions? So at the partnership, we've definitely been wrestling with a lot of these questions. And so I'm excited to hear from our panelists and steal all their good ideas. Um, so super brief uh, acknowledgement of who our panelists are. You do have a speaker sheet in your email. We'll link it again into the chat. Um, we have Dan Cardinale, President and CEO of Independent Sector. We have Lester Garcia, Political Director for SAIU Local 99. We have Jackie Goldberg, the Vice President of the Board of Education, Los Angeles Unified School District. We have John King, President and CEO of Education Trust, former Secretary of Education under Barack Obama. We have Sonia Santalisis, CEO, um, their version of a superintendent of Baltimore City Public Schools. So as a moderator, I will try to look for areas where we have different perspectives. I think that that makes for the richest uh, experience for everybody involved. So the goal is to create space for dialogue, explore tensions, have productive diversity of views ideally emerge. And as a moderator, I may occasionally interrupt to keep the conversation moving. Please accept my apologies in advance. Um, so the coronavirus has created an unprecedented, and I, I'm gonna open up with a question for each of the panelists. I, I ask you to keep it brief. Uh, one minute, ideally, uh, just to get a, a, a sort of temperature check on where you are. So uh, here's the question. The coronavirus has created an unprecedented break in structural paradigms that once seemed unmovable. It's demonstrated that the world can come to a screeching halt, that intricate systems can pivot on a dime, and that massive budgets can be thrown out and replaced. As we respond to the tragic consequences of COVID-19, we must also open our mind to the systems we'll one day return to. So we asked this of the audience and now we'll ask it of our panelists. Do you genuinely believe there are areas in public education where we can emerge, um, not just having survived, but stronger than before COVID? And if so, what are those areas, just quickly? And if you don't think so, why not? Um, and I'm going to start us off with Dan. 
Oh, thanks so much, Joan. It's really a delight to be with you all. Um, so yes, I very much believe that this is a kind of one of those moments that you don't want to waste. I would um, make kind of building off of your notion that the most vulnerable in evolution a creature is, is when it's not in the former stage and not yet in its arrival stage, and it can die. So I think I want to just punctuate that it is actually incumbent on all of us to seize this moment and that there are forces in systems sociologically always to retrench, to go back to what the former homeostasis was. So I think those of us who want to harness this moment really want to step forward and double down our energy and look for those pressure points. My particular passion is family and community engagement. And there is no doubt that we can think about redesigning public education where families and communities are integral in their design on how public education can work. So I think there's a lot we can talk about there and I look forward to the conversation. Thanks so much. Okay, Lester. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me on. Uh, Lester Garcia with SEIU Look 99. I think, uh, you know, kind of like in line with uh, with what Dan just laid out, um, I think, yes, change is possible. And yes, this is a moment that, if anything, aside from laying bare all of the different inequities that exist, also teaches us that um, these rules that we've created that sort of limit us from uh, getting families, getting students, getting people what they need are rules that we've created and rules that we've imposed on ourselves. So I do, th and you know, and we have an ability as, as, the, as you mentioned, Joan, uh, to throw it all out the window if we think something's important enough uh, that needs to be addressed. And so I do think that, you know, we have a really great opportunity to be able to really reshape our institutions. But as Dan laid out, um, we have to be intentional. It's not a given. Uh, it's not a given that things are gonna be different uh, when we come out of this, or at least that things will be better. Things will definitely be different, but that things will be better. We have to put in the work, uh, and we have to drive it, so. Thank you. All right, Jackie, can you uh, jump in next? Okay, yes. I've unmuted. <laughs> Have I unmuted? I hope so. Yes, we, I think we can I, hear you. Act I actually think there are going to be a number of areas where we're going to show some great improvement. One definitely is, is that already we know that the role of parents will be more critical. Uh, it's going to be more of a partnership. It's going to be a mutual support system between parents and teachers, I believe, if, if we're going to do anything, learn anything from this. I also think that we're going to be able to look at differentiated instruction much differently because with every kid, and we're close, but we're not there yet, but with every kid connected in a, to a device, it means that uh, we can use both the in-classroom, if we can figure out how to open classrooms, and outside of classroom online materials to much better differentiate for students uh, what, uh, what, how to meet their specific academic needs. It's hard to do in a classroom of 30 to 40 kids. It's a lot easier if, for example, we end up with 10 kids a day coming to school and that will help. I think the other thing that will uh, be very important is mental health. I think that's been very clear to those of us working with parents and kids right now is, is that the social emotional is going to probably get better attention and more attention. And the one other thing I think we have to keep in mind is, is that there are a group of students for whom online learning is desirable. They like it better. Why? Some of them were getting bullied at school. Some of them felt like misfits and outcasts. Now we need, need not to let them escape figuring out how for us to help them learn to get along with their peers, but we do need to do that. And finally, I think the most important thing is, is that schools are gonna become much more like community schools. That's an issue that's happening in the East Coast and the Midwest, but I think it's coming to California. And I think this is the moment for it. We've got 30 that we're gonna do in LAUSD already, but I think this is the time to look at expanding that much greater. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, John. Sure, thanks. So. My hope is that this is a New Deal-like moment for the country. If you think about yeah, really. the Great Depression and how we came out of the Great Depression with a collective commitment to strengthen our safety net, to build a more equitable economy. I hope this is that kind of moment for the country. Not that the New Deal was perfect either, but it was a moment where we built things like the Social Security Act that made a long-term difference. I hope this is that kind of moment 
around the inequities we're seeing on everything from the racial disparities and the health impact of COVID-19 to the fact that some folks have paid sick leave and others don't. So hopefully we come out of this with a strength and safety net. I hope that we come out of this with a, with a recognition that the internet should be a right, that everybody should have access to the internet, that uh, we need that for education, we need that to access economic opportunity. Folks shouldn't be locked out of internet access because of their immigration status or because we have an unpaid cable balance. Uh, and I hope we come out of this uh, ready to address some of the longstanding inequities and resources for our schools. We know that some school districts were able, because they have lots of resources, to transition to distance learning virtually overnight uh, with uh, very few bumps. Other districts did not have the devices, the bandwidth, the professional development for teachers, the capacity to make this transition as well. And hopefully this is a moment where we settle that issue and we say all kids deserve the resources to get a quality education. Thank you. Uh, Sonia, can you uh, close us off for this opening question? Sure. Uh, I think what I hope this moment brings is a real opportunity to rethink um, what the elements, basic elements of school are. So right now, so much of school and credit for school is driven by seat time, right? And how much time you spend in a particular space with a particular person, and it's not oriented around what students are actually learning. And I think this um, eruption, this you know, definite rupture, to the ability to access traditional space gives us the opportunity to think about that differently. I think the other piece is um, given the role of technology in a lot of um, unfortunately too many school districts that um, as was previously mentioned were under-resourced before um, are now ramping up with technology and I can even speak for Baltimore City if you look at our ratio of device to student prior um, to March 15th, I think was our last day to now, um, we're increasing regularly because it is a necessity. So um, one of the questions and opportunities is how do we use technology and other things to give us greater visibility into classrooms to leverage those, um, those teachers, those classrooms who frankly um, are more successful. And so how do we um, and more successful, frankly, with students that we know previously have not had equal access to high quality teaching. And so how do we begin to think differently um, about that? And frankly, differently about teacher roles, um, that there are now opportunities that in traditional systems with traditional, um, frankly, bureaucratic uh, structures that you know made it much harder to differentiate those roles. So there are teachers that are doing, frankly, a much stronger job in working with small groups of students, connecting with those students, helping to follow up, um, while others um, are specializing um, in more kind of upfront presentation of content. Um, just uh, and more adept. So how do we begin to shift out of this kind of one notion of what being a teacher looks like and actually organize teacher roles, administrator roles, starting with the kind of differentiation um, that I think Jackie referenced earlier. So um, this opportunity uh, that we have now is to really rethink what does access to higher level um, teaching look like, differentiated roles, um, frankly, moving away from this notion of seat time equals learning when we know that that's not the case. And so those would be some things I would just highlight as opportunities that we have right now. Well, that's fantastic sort of, uh, that's, that's a fantastic transition into our first question. So there are certainly those who would say classroom instruction, it looks far too much like it looked 200 years ago. Um, and now that we have this unprecedented disruptive event, um, and districts have been forced to go virtual overnight, how can we use this moment of punctuated equilibrium to re-envision the school day, instruction, how students experience learning? So you've already touched on that a little bit, Sonia, but do you wanna elaborate or provide any examples of what you're doing in, in Baltimore right now or would aspire to do? 
Sure. I mean, one of the things that we've taken this period of time, I think, tags along with something that I just referenced, and that is this idea of differentiated teacher role. Um, how do we, I mean, it doesn't, it hasn't had to be antagonistic, but we have teachers when we get, frankly, far greater visibility into the interactions of teachers, students, and their content. We have far greater visibility across the district to see um, who are the teachers who, based on some of their data, yes, but also the relationship and what we're seeing occurring in classrooms, frankly, are just um, more comfortable, stronger in using the technology, stronger in their content in a particular way um, that, that is more suitable for what I would call, high, and a lot of people would call high quality first teach, right? And so part of what we launched this past week um, was taking one or two of those teachers across grade levels, across a band of schools, um, and frankly, teachers who were far more comfortable um, partnering with that teacher, knowing that teacher was going to do a high quality grade level rigorous content, um, but that they then could really focus on following up with how individual students were, were learning. And so that ability um, that we have always known we needed to be able to accelerate student learning rather than just kind of putting kids in these kind of catch up boxes, I think is, is one of the things we've been looking at. The, the other piece we found is that um, because we knew we had far more um, challenging grade level standards aligned curriculum that we adopted prior to kind of the COVID um, uh, breakage or rupture. I can't remember, but the punctuated point, right? Is it punctuated equilibrium, Joan? I'm trying to- You got to it, you got it. Thank you, ma'am. Um, is, is now we're looking at that as a lever to say, all right, we've, we've set the standard in terms of the curriculum and where all young people need to be. How do we now leverage technology um, to be able to actually um, use that opportunity to give students uh, differentiated opportunities, yes, but also to give teachers the ability to more easily share across the district, to more easily observe what it looks like when Miss Fort in fifth grade um, actually can teach high level fifth grade level content um, to, to a, a differentiated group of students in terms of past achievement and actually um, what does that teaching of that content look like in ways that don't require a teacher to just sit and look at PowerPoints all day about what curriculum looks like. And so I think those are some of the ways that we've been thinking through um, what can that look like. And then one more thing I would just quickly add is for our high school students, as I think Jackie and a couple of other people noted, you know, what we're seeing very similar to what Jackie was referencing in LAUSD is we're seeing that a lot of the kids that we thought students we thought were lost and disengaged and didn't want to be in school who were chronically absent are actually the young people who are telling us now that I've got a laptop and I can do my work more flexibly and it's not just about showing my face. Um, I actually feel like I'm in greater control um, of my learning than before. So those are some of the things that, that we're looking into and I'm sure there are many others from, from folks that are, are participating. So John, is there anything you would add to that? Um, and, and, and after that, I'll invite you know, one more panelist. If you have a different perspective or anything uh, that hasn't been touched on, you can jump in as well, but John. Yeah, just build on that quickly, three thoughts. One is I think we've seen that the asynchronous work, the work that students are doing independently requires a different set of skills, requires students to be able to set goals, manage their time, ask questions when they need help, act on feedback from their teachers. And that set of skills has to be taught. So I think there's an opportunity here to do a lot more to think about how we build student agency Project-based learning is one way to do that. And this uh, distance learning model, but even the hybrid model we're likely to see come fall in many places is going to require us to be thoughtful about how we support students around project-based learning. And there are certainly curricula that are high quality. I think about the work that expeditionary learning has done, for example, that can help facilitate that kind of project-based learning. Second, I think there's um, an opportunity to think about how we organize time differently. Uh, there's good evidence on intensive tutoring as a way to help students uh, accelerate their progress. 
And so I hope what schools will do as we think about the return to school is think about how we might shift the schedule. We may need to go to staggered schedules for public health reasons, but there's also an opportunity to think about creating intensive tutoring opportunities for kids, maybe involving AmeriCorps folks in that intensive tutoring so that we uh, supplement what teachers are able to do with that additional support. And then the third thing I'd mention is, I think everyone is much more conscious now of the role of relationships in student uh, success and student experience. And I'm worried that in a lot of places, particularly if we go from online learning this year to online learning next year or have to switch to online learning very quickly next year, there won't have been the time to build relationships that folks had this school year. So I hope some people will think about for strong teachers, maybe there are opportunities to have teachers loop with students to maintain those relationships. I hope folks will invest in professional development around how to do uh, relationship building online, whether it's uh, making sure that you open with a question that is about checking in with kids before you dive into academic content or using breakout groups to build relationships between peers and for teachers to, to visit with those groups and, and build relationships there, online tutoring opportunities with their teachers during that asynchronous time. I think there's, there's a, a planning, that, a level of planning we need to do around that relationship building that's critical for the success of students' socio-emotional development as well as their academic success. So any final comment from anybody else on the panel uh, on this topic? Uh, any, yeah, Jackie, go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, so um, what I'm thinking uh, is also is to expand on the notion uh, that schooling is more than imparting information, but rather is about a connection to learning, about a commitment to learning. And it doesn't happen to ha have to happen within the four walls of a classroom, which is why I keep coming back to community schools because there, the, it's gonna be very clear at least to me, that we were going to, as we think about this, have to think about the context that the kids are living in. What is the role of education in their lives? How does it interface with their communities? Can there be a more positive connection so that students feel loved? Don't forget the community is the fabric in which the students exist. And I think this is the moment for us to make much greater and deeper connections in instruction on issues that are important to the communities that the young people uh, live in and go to school in. Can so, I just okay. weigh in just briefly on that? Just be, um, so uh, Jackie and, and John hit on something that I, I've been doing this a really long time and education for a long time didn't privilege relationships. It really privileged the imparting of information. And so the, we see this wonderful evolution, which is fantastic. Um, and exciting. I, uh, this notion of community school, which I am a, an enormous fan of and participated in, in that movement for many, many years, gets at equity issues. And we think about technology and this shift. Is it a permanent shift? And the great inequity in the way parents are now being expected to be an integral part with teachers in the education of their children with technology. So if we're going to engage technology as a community school movement, I think we're going to have to embed in it strategies that, to John's point, isn't just about helping students and teachers uh, manage the instructional side, but actually parents, engaging parents technologically so they can really evolve with their, their children. And I think it's, it puts a kind of pressure on the system that, as you talked about, you know, what are going to be the kind of hidden uh, forces that may hold us back from fully seizing this moment? And if we want to take parental engagement, not as just transactional so that we can get our educational outcomes, but actually the holistic development of children and their families. I think we're going to have to be quite intentional. And there are a whole set of community resources that can be leveraged to help us do that. But it really forces, I think, education leaders to expand how they have historically been trained and thinking about driving an academic institution as opposed to driving a community-based institution that allows for academic and non-academic flourishing of children and families. Okay, so Dan, let's go with that. There was a question that I was gonna ask on the parent side, but um, somebody wrote a question that I'll just read. Um, the questions we'll save for the end, but it was along the lines of what I was gonna ask. So Paula Roback wrote, this is 
for all the panelists, but I'm speaking to you right now, Dan. As you know, sadly, what passes for parent and family engagement in many, not all school districts, is nothing more than checkbox compliance, that bare, bare legal required minimum. What do you see as the best way for parents to sh shift gears in advocating for true, authentic engagement in our kids, schools, uh, in, in our, the education of our children? So we're tired of the same old, same old non-engagement, even alienation. So there are lots of levers here. Let me just hit on a couple. The first I would say is, as I just mentioned, and I won't repeat myself, as we shift to technology, there's a wonderful opportunity um, that parents can be engaged as part of the teacher curriculum, the ability for them to be an integral part with a teacher in the schooling of their children through technology. That's just a phenomenal peer relationship. So it isn't like you're a parent, you come to the school, it's my rules and my kind of world, especially for folks that are economically disenfranchised, the school isn't necessarily a great place or isn't a great experience. So there's a wonderful opportunity there. The second, I think, is around um, if, if the school is going to be a hub, now a virtual hub, how can parents and families be engaged in their own ability to stabilize their lives and flourish with their families. So access to a whole range, Jackie mentioned mental health services is a great example. We know that this is gonna be, the pandemic has just cut into the lives of community and particularly if you're poor and of color in a community, the disproportionate impact. And if we aren't addressing this as part of the public education strategy, not as recipients of kind of goodwill or of uh, client services, but as integral part of decision-making for the kids in the school, then I think we have, uh, we can break out of old modes. The last is that I think schools, um, at least my experience over 20 years, parents were often seen as a necessary um, uh, evil that you had to endure because they got in the way of instruction. And I just think now they're seen as real potential partners. And if we shift a mindset, then I think we can open up possibilities. So, you know, I, I feel like it, this has revealed both systemic gaps in how we maintain communications and contact with families, but also belief gaps, right? There are folks who just don't think that certain families are going to be engaged, largely low-income black and brown families at the same level as their middle-class peers. So how do you see, Lester, us sort of turning that on its head and addressing some of these systemic barriers to engaging families? Because it all, it, it feels like there's consensus, right? We, we believe there's an opportunity to engage differently, radically differently with families. Well, what, what stands in the way and how do we address those challenges, Lester? Well, I don't know how much time we have uh, left on this thing to go into all of that. But I, what I will say is, I mean, the million dollar question here is how are we going to operationalize all of this change that we're talking about, right? This is, you know, school has always been an all hands on deck moment, but school districts don't always take an all hands on deck approach, right? The pandemic has forced us to really think about all hands on deck. And I would say for the first time, at least with, you know, the vast majority, about 30,000 of the members that we represent, classified employees are in LAUSD. I can't remember the last time there was ever one unified training that every single employee would receive that was the same, right? And I anticipate that as we go into reopen schools, there's going to be need to be training around, there's going to be training required around physical distancing and you know, what to do, what not to do, and, and, and that sort of thing. I think one of the challenges that we have in parent engagement, aside from the fact that, you know, uh, working families needing to do two, three jobs, lack of access to technology, is really how are we utilizing every single person on every single campus, be it a virtual campus or in the physical campus or within this hybrid model, to play a role in keeping families connected, right? When school districts, or at least, you know, again, I'll go back to LAUSD, when, when, when Los Angeles rolled out uh, Common Core, there was no professional development, no systemic professional development for the folks responsible for parent engagement, right? There was no professional development for teacher's assistance. You're not maximizing all of the people that you have in place to provide the supports necessary. So I think that unless school districts really try to Number one, establish a baseline. There in LA, there is no baseline spending around what a school needs to be spending, investing in parent engagement, unless you start establishing these baselines and standards and really drive that and in, in a way where you can um, 
engage all of the personnel on your campus to play the role of keeping families connected, unless you have an eye towards everyone, unless you're working with your, um, the same way you need to work with your teachers in, in, in developing instructional ideas and, and curriculum and in the classroom, unless you're looking towards the folks, um, those employees that have connections to the parents, um, then we're always gonna come up short. It needs to be an all hands on deck approach all classified employees, every single person on that campus needs to have their role uh, spelled out in terms of what they do and how they help and connect with and support families. And, you know, the, the supports that we provide, we really need to think about beyond, uh, you know, um, I know the, the other speakers weren't saying that it should be limited to this, but really think about like economic supports, right? Homelessness was a crisis in Los Angeles long before the pandemic hit. Uh, you can probably expect that to rise. We have, we have yet to see the economic fallout of this pandemic. We, we, we haven't even started yet. We're, we're not even down that road yet. We're, we're still sort of waiting to, to go in. And so as we think about all of that, we, again, we really need to think about the role of every single person on a campus, be it physical or virtual. And what role are we giving them? What sort of training are we providing for them? What role are we carving out for them to support our families as we continue to move forward in this new environment? So speaking of the economic fallout, uh, let, let's talk a little bit about resource equity, policy and advocacy. Um, and I'll, I'll start with you, John, and then, and then I'll go to you, Jackie. Um, so transitioning to this idea of resource equity and advocacy, let's start with what we know. We know we're going into a recession. We know that history tells us the tide goes against equity in a recession. Uh, the politically powerful get more than what they need and those without access or proximity to power get hit the hardest. We talk a lot uh, about equity, but it's about to get real and we can't dance around this. It's obvious, right? 20% of the nation's unemployed right now, signs a lot of those jobs aren't coming back. The federal stimulus is already getting distributed in unequitable ways. We see the groundwork against equity being laid. So the imperative is greater. How can we, John, as systems leaders, leaders within this systems, in, interrupt that? Um, where should we be focusing our advocacy during this time when there's new visibility and momentum to address fundamental inequities? Well, at the federal level, we should be fighting for resources. So in the most recent stimulus that was passed, the CARES Act, uh, there simply just wasn't enough money for K-12 education. It was about $13.5 billion. It's just not nearly enough given the challenges we're seeing in state revenues. Uh, the House of Representatives recently moved a bill, the HEROES Act, that would put $100 billion towards education, K-12 and higher ed. Uh, still not enough given what we're seeing in states and districts. So we should be doing everything we can to persuade our federal leadership that we need a very substantial investment just to stabilize funding for school districts, but then additional funds to support um, addressing academic learning loss, addressing students' socio-emotional and mental health needs, addressing issues of food security. Uh, so at a bare minimum at the federal level, we should be asking for more so we min minimize the harm. At the state level, when decisions are made about what cuts would look like if the federal resources aren't enough to prevent cuts, we've got to make sure that folks cut in ways that minimize harm to the highest needs districts. In too many states, what we see is folks say there needs to be a cut, and so they cut across the board the same level every district. They say, oh, we're going to reduce every district by 10%, by 20%. Well, of course, high needs districts are more reliant on state aid and have less ability to be resilient when there are cuts. So we ought to cut in a way that takes into account need. At the local level, same thing holds true. Districts have to make sure that they don't allow the cuts to disproportionately impact the highest needs schools. What that often means is that the schools serving the most low-income students in a time of cuts have to cut programs and end up laying off a disproportionate share of their teachers. Uh, that shouldn't be. Districts should see their goal as protecting the most vulnerable students, and the cuts, if they have to be made, 
should fall more on those schools that have the most well-resourced children rather than falling on the schools that have the most uh, vulnerable students and the greatest needs. So there's both an, an advocacy need here, but also a responsible decision-making that is equity-focused that we, we desperately need. Mm -hmm. So Jackie, uh, uh, you're in charge of the budget committee, right, for LA Unified. Offer us another perspective here or, or build on that. Well, I don't think I can offer a different perspective because I largely agree with it. The problem is we don't have any money. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is how underfunded schools are in California before the virus. Uh, we get right now in this current year, 2019-20, about $17,000 a kid. New York is spending $30,000 a kid. If we were spending $30,000 a kid, we would have a very different situation in California public schools than we do. So yes, the state has made some commitment to uh, making sure that kids with most needs are the ones who get the most resources and the district has as well. But we also have to take into account, I think, the historical racism uh, because there are some things that happen to kids just because they are black and brown and poor or black, brown and Asian Pacific Island or Middle Eastern and poor or, or immigrants and poor or undocumented and poor. And when all of that happens, what you have is a situation in which you have kids that are doubly and triply and quadruply facing struggles and barriers uh, to acquiring academic achievement. So we need to be doing that. Now, what's going to happen in LA? Well, it's not good. Right now, uh, the state has decided uh, in California to cut uh, by about 10% the local controlled funding formula, which is really one of the ways that we do exactly um, spread money based on need and racist, racist histories and so forth, uh, but that's going to be cut. Uh, we don't know whether or not we're going to have enough money uh, to even maintain the current teaching staff uh, as it is, as well as assistance, as well as aides, as well as all of the classified people that we need to maintain to make sure that their cafeteria is running and buses run and the school gets sanitized if we're able to reopen it. So I don't really know, to be very honest with you, I don't know what we're going to do for money because it's going to cost LA and Oakland and maybe a couple of other very, very low income districts a lot more money to reopen than it will districts that are affluent where the kids uh, don't need it as much economic support at home uh, for them to get to school and so forth. So this is gonna be a real problem. And I would say that anybody listening to this uh, would be good to just uh, email or write Governor Newsom and say, look, it's time for you to begin thinking about taxing the wealth of this state. We're the fifth richest economy in the world. That means there's only four other nations that have a economy larger than California. So if we're the fifth richest economy in the world, there's no excuse for us being in the low 40s in our uh, what we get per kid for those kids. And LA Unified and Oakland and uh, Fresno and parts of San Diego are underfunded dramatically now. And if we don't figure out how to change that, uh, all of our great desires to take advantage of the virus to up grade our things is, is going to be a lot harder. And I, I'm, I'm not happy right now as a, as a chair of the budget committee, because I don't know how we're going to do this. Well, so let me ask uh, one, any of the other panelists who haven't commented on this topic yet. You know, when we talk about resource equity, we're, we're often focused, I mean, clearly there's huge financial cliff ahead of us. Um, but I, I don't think only of the um, financial resources. I think of equity around how we approach staffing, facilities, all sorts of other areas. So um, how about Sonia or Lester, do you wanna offer us some insight into how you're thinking about advocacy and equity in this moment where, you know, as, as, as Jackie um, and John have, have laid out, I mean, the, the, the opportunities and the challenges are great um, on the financial side. Are there other, are there other aspects of, of your approach that you wanna highlight? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that a bit. I do think that we still have to be able to acknowledge what we also know 
um, internal to districts. And I think a lot of the comments were spot on in terms of those of us who are in leadership positions in districts and in schools cannot deny what was true before COVID. And that is who has access, right, to the most highly effective teachers. Um, highly effective teachers that teach in majority black and brown schools, right, end up having heavier caseloads, right, have more turnover of newer teachers and therefore have additional responsibilities, right? And I think the, the, the piece that we've been having discussions about, and, and again, it goes back to this, you know, these other resources around teaching, around who gets to come back first. And I know it's loaded because no district has completely figured out how we're gonna come back and do school in the fall. Um, but let's be clear, right? The discussions about which students um, get more supports, right? Who gets the tutors that John referred to, right? How, how are we ordering that? Um, is, is an in-district equity question. Now we've had, we've done equity mapping within our own district at the same time that we were advocating as part of the state's, you know, Kerwin Commission for a, a new uh, funding formula that I think does get at some of the funding inequities. However, what is also really clear is that if we, e even pre-COVID, if we got all of that money and only distributed those resources according to kind of current patterns without the push and the questioning of where those resources go, then I think we, we're only part of the way there. And one of the things that I like saying is everybody's for equity until it means they think their kid's not gonna get something. And it's very interesting how that plays out. And so how do we make sure that we are building the overall community and family discussions that are not kind of this null set, you, like winner take all, but actually are building an understanding of some of the historical pieces that, that we're putting in, you know, that, that folks are referencing that, you know, I mean, redlining in Baltimore still has impact today, but if we're not willing to take a look at what that access looks like. I mean, we, when we distributed and invested in our new advanced placement classes, we started with schools that traditionally had either none or very low numbers. We didn't go to the schools that already had 20 offerings. And I think this is the kind of lens that communities um, should have for those of us in leadership positions. So if we're, you know, we need to also, I think, hold up the mirror to our own practices to make sure that, that the other resources are going that way. It's not just about the more money. It's about mm -hmm. how the money is being allocated once it lands in school districts. Mm -hmm. Lester, how do you think about that, that, that sort of um, dual imperative and that tension between adequacy and equity? Yeah, I mean, I think Sonia brings up a lot of really uh, excellent points. I think, you know, we have seen when things are dire, when resources are scarce, you see a push for equalization, right? Um, people want to shy away from difficult conversations because they feel now is not the time uh, to have those conversations. So we're seeing a potential uh, cliff um, in our budgets. So we should expect people to say now is not the time to talk about equity. Right. They're going to. And and those of us who have been um, who see equity, not just as sort of a buzzword, uh, but a lens by which we examine everything that we do know that these times call equity needs to be front and center when things are dire. Right. The more dire the situation, the more uh, the important role that equity plays in defining what the pathway out uh, is going to be. So I think like Sonia laid out. Uh, you know, we have to use equity as a lens by which we examine everything. Um, so everything from how we're allocating the resources that we do have, um, and to your point, Joan, not just sort of on the instructional side, but even looking at looking at our employees, right? Uh, we had uh, during this uh, shutdown, uh, um, there was a the governor issued an, an order saying that there shouldn't be impacted uh, impact of benefit of time for employees that need to be out sick. Right. So this is typically seen as like a, as an HR issue or an employee or a labor issue. Uh, we've been approaching it as a public health issue. Right. So if an employee is is feeling sick, has a low grade fever um, and has to take a look at their pay stub to see how many sick days do I have left and should I go to work? 
right? We want to avoid those types of situations, right? We want to make sure that any employee who feels sick, who's running a low grade, low grade fever, says simply stays home, right? We don't want them debating, okay, you know what? I don't have any sick days left. I'm going to go anyway and potentially expose every single child and every single adult on uh, that classroom. And, and for us as a, as a union, that is an equity issue because the people that we find with less amount of sick days, with the with that don't have the ability or the luxury to be able to take time off. In California, the average income for a classified school employee is about twenty two thousand dollars per year, and so um, we have members who are homeless. We have members who are we have a, a standing food bank year round that uh, that is just constantly uh, being emptied out because the need is there. And these are public employees. These are public school employees. Um, that do not have access to healthcare, that do not have access to pensions, do not have access to any sort of retirement um, uh, system. So as we think about equity, we have to you know, look at obviously all of the things that have already been said. I think Sonia laid it out beautifully in terms of, of, of what that looks like at the school level. As we look at the personnel and the people that we're asking to actually carry out this work, we have to make sure that that equity exists for them as well. And it's not just an employer issue. It's not just a collective bargaining issue. What the pandemic has showed us is that it is actually a public health issue, right? Dealing with these things and making sure that these workers have protections is also about protections for kids, protections for families, and preventing the spread of this virus throughout our communities. All right, so hey, Dan, there's a question. I'm going to jump to some questions from the audience, and I'll, I'll ask you to answer the first one. I just want to make one little comment on the last topic before okay, you sure. go, just very short. Please. And that is, and that is to say that the the question uh, of how much funding we get from the state is so critical that we cannot approach any of the issues that are being raised by all of us uh, very well without additional funding. And that's I, I cannot leave that because mm -hmm. seventeen thousand is going to drop to fifteen thousand. Fifteen thousand, seventeen wasn't enough. 15 will make it virtually impossible. And the word that uh, Lester said about equalization is what happens in Sacramento is, is that the rich and middle-class districts combine and insist that money that comes to schools must come same dollars to every district, regardless of the fact that LA Unified, for example, has more than 80% of our kids on free and reduced lunch. And there are districts with almost no kids on free and reduced lunch. And we get the same amount of money. This is insane. This is not mm -hmm. equity. We need to talk about the fact that you cannot call, use this word equalization all the time to say that, oh, it's just fine. Everybody should get the same dollars. No, they shouldn't. Yeah. And you and Sonia carry that weight heavily. Running districts in this moment is, is just hugely challenging undertaking. So actually, I think this is a related question that we can jump into, Dan. And, I, and it, it's so how can, this is from Carlos Rodriguez from Innovate Public Schools. And the question is how can this moment of disruption be a moment of democratic expansion whereby working class black and brown parents give, gain more access to the levers of decision-making in public school systems? What are some specific policy shifts that would reflect this evolution? You know, and, and the way I think it's connected is, is if we're going to, tackle Prop 13 or overall funding adequacy issues, it's gonna, it's gonna be because there's a huge will to do so. And so I, I think there's, there's a nice connection between these thoughts, but can, can you offer us any reflection? Uh, sure, I'll offer, um, and hopefully pivoting, pivoting off a little bit of the conversation we just had, that um, if we think about community schools as um, a strategy that it actually expands the access to resources to ensure public education is maximized in its utilization, not just of financial, but of all of the resources in a community to enable every child with a targeted user universalism strategy that certainly I'm a big proponent of integrated student supports, which really is a tailored approach, not just on the learning side, but on the holistic developmental side. Then you expand into budgets beyond just the school system budget. So you can look at things like mental health services and the, the health and human service budget. And you begin to say, how are those aligned 
around an equitable distribution that ensures kids and families have what they need in order to be fully present in however the design of education begins to unfold. So I just wanna label that, that um, I, and I'm not at all taking away from Jackie's point that uh, appropriately and equitably resourced schools and the personnel that's required and the facilities to be able to run those well so that kids and teachers are able to be focused on the learning is exactly right. So, but I just think we can expand the notion of what equitable distribution of resources can be. The final thing I would say is that what if, if in fact parents are going to now become even more an integral element to child's academic flourishing, then policies that support um, particularly parents from with a wide range of flexibility. You know, it, you know, the hidden secret that we're not saying is that public education is designed as a childcare system so that folks can work, right? And if you're working in a non-standard way and you're now an integral part to your child's success, you've got to figure out strategies both on the worker side as well as on how schools are designed in order that parents are flexibly able to be a part of their kid, not as a nice to have or an exception, but as part of how they work. So we know that service workers, frontline workers tend to be browner and blacker, and they tend to be, have multiple jobs in order to make uh, the, um, the family wage work. So how are schools set up and what are the policies that are put in place that give appropriate and equitable voice in the design of those folks who may not be able to fit into the, you know, parent teacher at 7 a.m. conference or the 7 a or 7 p.m. staying late and the uh, teacher is exhausted from a, a day. So there'll be just a couple of things that I would throw out for kind of uh, discussion. Well, um, if anybody has a burning desire to add, please jump in, but I'll also try to put forth a few of the questions and they cover a range of topics. So this is a combined, there, there have been a few comments about sort of uh, collective bargaining from Hayen Kimner and Mark Jubata. Um, so the question is a shift away from the language practice of instructional minutes and seat time will also need to be reflected in how we consider collective bargaining conversations. What are the ways in which students, families, teachers, educators can help drive those conversations so that they are student and relationship centered, not just about the clock. And the other aspect of this question was what role leverage might teacher union have on the various solution options being presented? Uh, Joan, if I can just um, weigh in on this. So um, for us as, as a union, um, any good union, you know, you're, you're focusing on wages, benefits, and working conditions. And that's sort of the task, no matter what sector you're in. For us, SEIU Local 99, over half of our members are parents in LAUSD. Uh, about two thirds of our members live within two miles of the schools that they work at. And so they have all of these additional layers um, to their, that contribute uh, to their identity uh, and that contribute to um, what they expect and, and where they want their to place their political capital or the political capital of the union. We're big believers in we should lead with a vision of what public education can and should be and then allow the jobs to follow. Right. So any collective bargaining agreement, any demand that we bring to the table with the school district is centered on a vision uh, for public education that starts with what do kids need to learn. Right. Um, we don't go the other way around. We don't simply demand hours or demand wages or demand benefits without thinking through what is the relationship uh, and how are we leading with a vision of good public schools. And I think the biggest thing that folks can really do is to really we don't the biggest opportunity we have right now is we have somewhat of a blank canvas. Right. To say this is what things are going to look like. We shouldn't shy away from now. We can't be naive in terms of our economic reality, but we should all be bold in putting out a vision of what public education can and should be. All the participants have been sort of just perusing to who's on there and recognizing a whole bunch of names. People have been doing this work for a very long time. So part of what we need you to do is to keep doing what you're doing, to amplify that voice around what our schools need and what our schools need to look like. I think the leverage that, that labor can bring in uh, teachers unions, classified unions, and, and, and other folks is to be able to really, you know, help support what that vision is. So if, if community is leading with a vision, then, then frankly, it makes our job easier 
because there is an expectation around how schools need, what schools need to look like and how they need to be organized. And then our demands follow that. And I think one of the great things about a collective bargaining agreement and where we've had successful partnerships uh, with folks like Inner City Struggle, Community Coalition here in, in LA is by finding ways that we can actually incorporate, and UTLA has done this as well, incorporate those community demands into a collective bargaining agreement. Right, and, and those are solidified, they, they're, they're, they're legal, it's not some policy that can go away, um, but they, uh, they, they'll hold up, literally hold up in court, right? And so I think, again, just to reiterate, I think the biggest thing that we could do is really stick on what that vision is of what public education can and should be. And every conversation we have, whether we're having a conversation around budgets, whether we're having conversation around how we're organizing our, our, our staff or what our communities look like, all of it should be, should be driven by what that vision is and should be working towards that vision. So does anybody else wanna weigh in differently on this question of what role leverage might teachers union have on the various solutions being presented? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and ask a uh, another question here that um, I think is gonna resonate, which is really around this idea of trauma. Um, it, you know, the, the level of trauma that our many of our students already experienced was unimaginable, and now it's just gotten it's gotten you know so much more acute. And so, what are the ways um, in which you're thinking about? Uh, centering the, the, the whole child. How, how are you thinking about this moment in relation to meeting the social emotional needs of our scholars? You know, um, I've been working with uh, both Hilda Solis and uh, um, uh, who's a supervisor for those of you who are not from LA uh, on our, our LA County Board of Supervisors. Uh, there are five of them. And uh, she and I share many schools in common uh, in the school district as part of her supervisorial district. We've been talking about having the county pay for psychiatric social workers in some of the schools with greatest need. Uh, that's another area that I think we need to be looking more into. And I think this pandemic is also pushing us to do is to say to the city of Los Angeles, what can you do to be more helpful to the kids that whose families live in, in your various council districts to say to the, uh, the County Board of Supervisors, mm -hmm. uh, you have income that's annual every year in, the, in public uh, mental health. Uh, we need some of that money to be spent in our schools. They're already doing some, but I think that needs to be expanded much more dramatically because the amount of trauma is enormous. Kids are, seniors have, have been flipping out. Uh, we've had some deaths uh, of seniors who just don't know what their lives are going to be like. I mean, this is really unbelievable. I, we, we have eighth graders for whom culmination was like the most important thing that ever happened in their whole lives and it ain't happening. Uh, so disappointment, uh, isolation, these are things that children, uh, adults don't do so well with them either, but children do lots of times even have a harder time. So we have a lot of mental health needs. And I think uh, that the continued uh, uh, discussions I'm having with the County of Los Angeles and other school board members with supervisors that represent their areas, I think we're going to see a more of a partnership around mental health issues. Yeah, this hey, idea John? of, uh, yeah, Dan, please jump in. Just two things real quick. Uh, I, I agree with uh, Jackie, but I would say that uh, uh, John King mentioned something that I thought was really profound uh, around the role of relationship. And we know from you know, a lot of research now that uh, the relationship between a teacher and a student or community members and students become the platform on which healing of trauma can take place. So I just wanna uh, underline something that he pointed out as a really critically important uh, a focal point, especially as we think about this redesign that this moment is creating. The second piece I just wanna uh, highlight is that um, when uh, mental health strategies are become integral in the planning for teachers at the individual as well as the collective level and the student, you get a, uh, an environment that becomes uh, de-traumatizing or healing. So, uh, so oftentimes we see mental health in one lane, academic um, 
work in another. And I just am a very strong advocate that they're seen as really two sides of the same coin so that you, you can address the reality that not only kids and families, but actually teachers as well and the administrative staff have been through traumatic experiences. And so integrating this into the overall architecture of the system and then in the design strategies, uh, excuse me, the instructional strategies is a, is a phenomenal opportunity. Mm -hmm. John, I saw you come off mute. Did you want to jump in? Yeah, yeah just, just really to build on Dan's point, I said one of the challenges here, it goes back to our earlier conversation about funding, is I think we have to hold as a sector two ideas in mind. One, we have to be relentless in our advocacy for more resources, resources to address learning loss, resources to stabilize school district budgets, resources to address mental health and socio-emotional needs along the lines of what Jackie described. And at the same time, we have to ask, with the resources we have now, are there things we could be doing better or differently to support our students? And it's sometimes hard to hold both of those things and people try to play them against each other, but they, we have to do both. If we're thinking about how we better leverage existing resources, a few ideas. One, uh, the Phoenix Union School District in Arizona has a Every Student Every Day initiative where they are trying to make sure that an adult with the school district is in touch with every kid every day. And they've deployed every adult, central office staff, superintendent, teachers, principal, everybody, to be in touch with kids and using that conversation to check how kids are doing, socio-emotionally, but also to see if they need food, if they need a Wi-Fi hotspot, what they need in order to be able uh, to continue their education. Two, uh, Folks need professional development around how to do socio-emotional learning integrated with kids' academic experience. And that's true in an online environment, it's true in a um, direct instruction in the classroom environment. So you think about, for some elementary school kids, the thing that is keeping them going is that their teacher is doing the morning meeting every day. And so they have half an hour at the start of the day where they see their teacher, they see their peers, and everybody checks in with how they're doing. And that's huge for them. And that's something we should make sure all kids are getting, that regular opportunity to, to, to connect with adults and peers at school. But then in the curriculum, we can also do things to support kids' socio-emotional development. And that's from the meta level, like in this English language arts curriculum, do I ever see myself represented? One of the real problems with a lot of the materials that are available for distance learning is you don't see folks of color represented. You don't see LGBTQ folks represented. You don't see questions of immigration status dealt with. So making sure the curriculum has windows and mirrors so kids see themselves and see worlds beyond their own. Uh, making sure that kids have opportunities to do projects and group discussions, things that engage them with peers. So they're not just working on projects in isolation and tasks in isolation. So I, I think this question of how do we make socio-emotional learning deeply interconnected with kids' academic experience has to be at the heart of how we think about planning for next school year. And then I mentioned earlier, looping. You know, if students had a phenomenal third grade teacher maybe they should be with that teacher for fourth grade and that may be an opportunity for them to start the year with those relationships and get more quickly into the work of the school year. Again, that may only work for the strongest teachers in the right set of circumstances, but we ought to be thinking about that. We ought to be thinking about, should we keep cohorts of students together because they have relationships with those peers? It, again, we have to strike this balance between advocacy for more resources and thinking about smarter deployment of existing resources. Yeah, John. So, yeah, I, I would just echo that the conversations I've been having with young people in our district, particularly um, middle and high school students, have just, I think, reinforced what folks have been saying that um, the phone calls matter, right? Those touch points matter. Um, the uh, check ins, you know, starting, we had embedded. Um, some of our SEL learning in our curriculum is part of why we chose some of the curriculum materials we did because we knew that some of these check-in points were built in. Um, and I also just, again, want to point out that a lot of the communities that we serve in our schools 
um, had been holding a lot of trauma for a long time. And so the, I think it's also really important and I, I can't stress enough what, what John was just saying about we've, we've got to hold both, right? And for a lot of our young people, you know, that I've talked to and talking to colleagues across the country, you know, are seniors who don't think they'll be able to go to college anymore, right? And so who is actually helping them process that, right? And it's not about just, you know, how do we get you connected with a particular mental health professional? Because let's be clear, the mental health field also has its own equity issues, right? So we weren't doing all that fabulously um, with that to begin with. Like we still had some of those issues to work out there. So I think th this piece about like a whole child approach is understanding that, that the wellness for a lot of kids is actually being able to connect um, in real ways through relationship to kind of healing spaces that Dan um, talked about, but also, you know, for some kids, it's it's knowing that I don't have to give up the idea of going to college now because COVID hit, and who's going to actually help me navigate that information now that my family is so focused on, frankly, just staying alive from day to day, and are we making sure that those connections are still there? So I think looking at the variety of entry places. Um, and just the diversity of student experiences that I'm hearing. Um, but all, all of it comes back to this idea of healing spaces that Dan mentioned, relationships that John mentioned, and frankly, not, not giving up the ground on the fact that schools still are the place that most families connect with to make sure that, they're, that their students, that their young people have the skills that they need um, academically and, and you know, in terms of navigating what their future dreams are. So I, I do think we have tried to be stressing both here. Um, and I think that that's important. Mm -hmm. So one question that came up uh, earlier on from Robert Bosley is I hear a lot of hope about changes. How do you move past just hope? And more importantly, who outside of the education world do we need to bring to our side to help make all this happen? So uh, thoughts on that? How do we enlist the support of a broader cross-section of our communities to pass schools and communities first in November, which would chip away at Prop 13? How do we do that equivalent in all these other areas we've discussed? Thoughts there? So Joan, I think um, we have a whole bunch of participants on here um, who are doing just that. Uh, on a daily basis. Um, they are building, uh, they're base building organizations. I know we have a mix of folks. Some folks are more on the policy side. Some folks are more kind of on the think tank side, but, um, but there are plenty of base building organizations. I think part of what we need to do is develop the vehicles for that constant communication and collaboration, right? Uh, break down some of the barriers uh, between, that have existed in the past between labor and some of the community organizations and things like that. Because I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, and I know sort of we say this a lot and we said this pre-COVID, but it really is going to take all of us pushing and pushing in one direction uh, to be able to do this. And so we have this really tremendous opportunity to do that. Um, and uh, and we need to create the space for it. If we're not intentional about, about creating a space and, and being in constant communication, utilizing the networks that we already have to start organizing some of these conversations to come together and develop long-term plans around this stuff, um, then it's not going to happen. Then, then you know, there'll be a lot of wonderful conversations, and 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 I'm sure some good books are going to come out of this uh, down the road. Uh, but um, and I look forward to reading them. But um, we're not going to get there. We're not going to get there unless we actually carve out the space to do this work. Um, so whether it's in your city um, or in your state or nationally. Um, we need to start carving out um, some of these spaces. And I think, you know, what the partnership is doing today by actually creating that space and beginning the conversation on it is an important first step. Uh, and then how we organize ourselves to actually develop a concrete and tangible plan that we can push for us locally here in LA, but also statewide uh, is going to be an important one. But again, I think we have a bunch of folks who are participants here who will do it on a daily basis. Um, and, uh, and we'd love to connect and figure out how we move this forward. Okay, so, a oh, John, did you want to jump in and then a final question? Yeah, I think Lester is exactly right. Organize, organize, organize. And I just would say that as we do that, we have to 
lift up student and parent voice in that. I think stu students have particularly powerful insights uh, about what is working or not working for them. And so creating tools at the district and state level where those voices can be heard, whether it's surveying folks, creating opportunities for uh, students to participate in focus groups to give feedback on what they're experiencing. Um, but you know, they're, the, they're the customers of the school experience and they will tell you if a class is boring, they will tell you if a class is ineffective, they will tell you if they're getting uh, the emotional support they need or not. And so we should ask them. Mm -hmm. So this is a final question and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll give everybody a, a moment to answer it. Um, so what, what kind of commitment, I mean, given what's emerged from this conversation and the work you've been doing, what specific commitment will you or have you already made to seize this opportunity for public education to emerge stronger? Um, and I'll, I'll let a brave soul start us off. Jackie. Uh, I've already made a, uh, a commitment to a number of things. First of all, uh, we are at the district level already working with all our labor partners, with parents, with students, and with uh, heads of divisions to talk about how do you reopen a school district uh, uh, when you cannot guarantee the safety of everybody. And we've been told by our, our health department that there is no way to guarantee safety. Uh, the best you can do is to do a number, as many things as you can to reduce the risk, but we can't guarantee the teachers or the classified employees, the custodians, we can't guarantee anybody's safety because uh, it's a silent attacker and people don't have to have uh, any uh, symptoms to be uh, contagious. So knowing that, we have to talk first about it with everybody, and we are, it's already going on in LA Unified. Uh, we have to talk about what what, make, what things will make uh, us have the safest possible schools, even though we can't be safe. Secondly, then we need to be talking in groups, large and small. And I think here's where teachers and teachers unions are very important as well, because uh, if uh, those of you who are in local remember that the strike that we had in Los Angeles was not largely about uh, income, wages and working conditions, because uh, those had prior to the strike been pretty much agreed upon. The, the issues were about more nurses, were about more counselors. The issues were about more uh, folks who uh, can reduce class size. The issue was about starting more community schools. So the negotiations will be very important, but I do think we've already made a big change in how we connect with parents. Uh, I had before uh, the shutdown of schools several town hall meetings in which I averaged 75, maybe 100 people. Uh, my town hall meetings online have been six and 700 people with 2,000 more watching it on uh, Facebook. So we now know better how to reach parents. Uh, and that's something now that we know that. So we can't let go of that. We have to say, now that's the way we continuously get feedback. And then my district staff is working now to figure out how to identify students in each of our schools to get their feedback on a regular basis through student town hall meetings. This is a critical piece. The critical piece is for all of us to see us as partners in making these changes. Without that, you really can't do that. And we need the public as well to be advocates for appropriate funding, uh, which is not what we're getting right now in California. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, rapid fire round, Robin, for the rest of you. One, one commitment that, that you have top of mind for, your, for yourself and your roles that you wanna leave us with. This is Dan. Um, so two things real quick. Uh, we continue to advocate at uh, independent sector that uh, states and uh, local uh, municipal structures get uh, funding subsidies in order to be able to keep their systems moving. We see that as critically important. Um, and so a number of people have made uh, advocated for funding 
to school systems. Uh, we're right there. Secondly, is funding nonprofits who are often the critical partners to schools so that they can do these community schools, they can provide the kind of supports that uh, schools aren't necessarily set up to be able to produce. So we're going to go, we're, we'll continue to advocate in both those ways. Well, I, I, I'm afraid that uh, we're close up on time. So um, I think I'm going to have to just go ahead and turn it over to Ryan to close us out. I'm sorry we didn't hear a final word from all of you, but so appreciate your participation and your insights um, and the leadership you exercise every day in your various roles. It is with great gratitude that I, I say farewell and thank you. And um, I'll turn it back over to Ryan. So first of all, uh, we have to thank these dynamic panelists for covering so much ground in a, such a short amount of time. I'm really appreciative of what we've heard here. Um, a couple of things I'll highlight. It feels like this conversation uh, really started to galvanize around doubling down on relationships. We heard John, um, Sonia, and a number of folks just talk about the need to think about relationships differently. We heard Dan talk about relationships between families and communities can be different in this moment. Um, we also heard um, the need to think differently about um, the conversation around adequacy and equity when it comes uh, to budgeting, which I think is going to be really important. We heard everyone, including Jackie and John um, and Lester, uh, talk about that as well. I will leave you with my commitment, which was one that I thought Lester and John hit profoundly, this need to think differently about power shifting and how we work with parents, communities, labor partners differently in this moment. Um, so if we, we all should commit, um, and I'm excited uh, that we have this discussion. So first of all, join me in welcoming and thanking, pardon me, and thanking our um, panelists. Um, we are gonna follow up. We are going to follow up um, with the Facebook Live link. Um, if you register, and this will be on our partnership Facebook Live as well. So we recorded all of this, um, but I'm appreciative of this moment. As Lester mentioned, this is the beginning of a conversation and we need to create space to continue this conversation. So please look forward um, to many more um, webinars and conversations, discussions that the partnership and others um, will uh, host. So on behalf of the partnership, thank you, John. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Lester. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, thank you, Dan. Um, thank you, partnership staff who organized this. And thank you for the almost 400 folks um, who got online today uh, to watch us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Um, take care. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye.